Very much indeed. And uh, I'm very, very happy to have this opportunity to uh, uh, share ideas and uh, meet uh, old friends again uh, after a long time. And I'm just so grateful this technology makes it possible. It's funny you should have John Turner Vicente because uh, he was obviously the big influence on my career. Um, and uh, he contributed to another book, which I did. Uh, and uh, I was contacted recently by the publisher. This was a book called The Living Towards a Sustainable Future. And I co-edited that and contributed. Um, and the publishers contacted me recently and said they plan to reissue it. Nice. Without any changes. And it was reissued a couple of months ago. Now, the initial reaction to that is obviously great flattery and a very good feeling that they want to do it. Then you think, actually, if it's a book towards a sustainable future published in 1990, is still considered relevant, either nobody read it or nobody took any notice of it, because Turner contributed a very good chapter, Ari Fassan, and a lot of other leading people. And you think, well, isn't it sad that the world seems to be going round in circles? A lot of things need to be said again and again and again. Um, so it's on that basis that I'll be talking today in a way, uh, because I want to uh, use this corona pan um, coronavirus pandemic as a chance for us all. Certainly I'm sitting back and reflecting on what I've been doing and what implications it may have for the future. Um, and just thinking personally, I was born when the British were the head of an empire, a vast empire. And now we've become just a small island going it alone in a very, very uncertain context. Uh, but I, I qualified in 1968, the year of student protest around the world. And when we really were so arrogant and innocent to think that we could change the world. And I was lucky I got a scholarship to go to India and to study uh, the, the issues of uh, migration, people coming into the city looking for jobs, looking for a better future for themselves and their children. And I remember being invited for lunch at the British Council and a very nice lady asking me what I was doing. And I said, well, I'm studying the slums. And she said, oh, so what did I think needed to be done? And I said, well, the people tell me that they want basic services, basic security, and to be left alone. And she said, oh, how interesting, and turned and spent the rest of the meal with the person on the other side. So I very quickly got the idea that that wasn't what she wanted to hear. What she wanted to hear was, how can we stop all these people flooding the cities and spoiling them? And that's when I became aware of the different attitudes towards urbanization, development, and so on. And after that work, um, I went to, uh, to uh, I came back from India, and I was invited to give a lecture at the AA School of Architecture. And Paul Oliver, one of the great writers on vernacular architecture and blues music, said, well, we don't actually have anybody teaching that. Would you like a job? Uh, so for four years, I, I worked with John Turner, taught at the AA, left the AA, um, and, or, and did some research in Turkey. Um, so maybe if we start on the slides, um, we can go to uh, sharing the screen. And uh, I'll go in now into the lecture, and I'll keep talking about the ideas that uh, I was concerned about. Can we do the sharing of the screen uh, Vicente? Yes. Okay. Uh, go to that now, rather than everybody have to look up my nose from the camera angle on my computer. Is that? Can you share it? Uh, oh, I, I share. Okay, sorry, share screen, absolutely. Yeah. It, it's better because you have yep. the control on the slides. Yeah. Okay, have you got it? Yep, yep. Just so I go uh, into uh, slideshow from the beginning. Okay, have you got yeah, that? Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Great. So I will now uh, go through. When I arrived in Delhi, I spent about a year living in this, not living in, but visiting, spending all my time in this particular squatter settlement, which had been built along the side of the railway line. 
And one thing that quickly impressed me was that open space is never, ever wasted. If you go to any squatter settlement, any informal settlement, anywhere in the world, they use every square centimeter of land and they use the same land for different uses in different times of the day, different times of the week, different times of the year. In this image, you can see a guy cooking on a, on a pot in the middle of the thoroughfare. In the distance, there's some animals grazing. You can't quite see them because of the smoke. You can see people in the foreground sitting on what are beds, which they may sleep on at night. And you can see children playing. So what you're looking at is actually the living room of the community. On a plan, it would show it as a road. But this is their living room because the houses they live in are actually very small. This is actually one of the biggest houses. And there's a group of women sitting under a tree making the most of the chance to interact uh, because their houses are so small. This is, as I say, one of the biggest ones. So one of the first lessons I learned is that the way you use space, the way you use land is very, very different if you're poor than if you're rich and you can afford high standards. Many, many public schemes I've seen, professional planning schemes, wasteland um, to an enormous extent. And after I'd worked there, I went and did a research project in, in Ankara, Turkey. And as you can see there, there's apartment blocks on the top of the screen. At the bottom are what they call gechikondus. And Vicente came with me when I went back after doing my initial studies in 74, 75. In fact, I went there first of all because I wanted to take my students. And I persuaded the director of the AA to let me buy a Volkswagen minibus. And Rita, my wife, and I drove our students to Turkey from London drove around uh, Ankara, uh, did the study and drove back and sold it for a profit. So I was quite popular. You'd never be allowed to do that now, of course. But what we found was that the low income people came into the city, found a piece of government land, and under the Ottoman Land Act, they were allowed to actually occupy and develop it if they brought the land to life. And then over time, a developer would come in, off, occup, off, offer them uh, the land, and maybe two apartments in the new block uh, because he didn't have to pay for the land. So everybody over a period of time was able to be assimilated into the formal uh, land market. And that was all done on a self-financing basis. Everybody benefited, the poor, the developers and the city. So I wanted to see how we could learn from that process to see how you could work as planners to facilitate bottom-up participatory self-financing urban development. Now, then I'd like to go and talk about some of the drivers of change because um, obviously a key one is colonialism. And it's interesting, you might say, well, colonialism ended decades ago, a century ago. Uh, but in fact, it was only four years, five years ago that India replaced the Land Acquisition Act passed in 1894 by the British. So colonialism still has a very long shadow life, which is influencing what goes on now. Of course, industrialization, globalization have all exerted massive impacts. I was just reading a paper the other day about uh, how the 22 million migrants in uh, the Gulf states alone are being adversely affected by the coronavirus in pandemic and uh, what's being done to rescue them. So we're looking at uh, drivers of change which have had a massive impact. A lot of people, like the lady who interviewed me in, in, over lunch in Delhi, think that urban growth can be controlled and managed and stopped. For me, the challenge is how to manage it. Not many people realize that a 30% of, in, of uh, China's urban population are not counted in the urban statistics. There's 70 million estimated urban residents in uh, the big cities of China, which are not even counted in the numbers. So if you think of Shanghai as 18 million people, you can add another 6 million to that that are living there without legal permission. Uh, but they're, they're still contributing. In fact, they're probably essential to the urban economy. 
At the moment, globally, about a billion people are living in slums, squatter settlements. They think that could well go up to 2 billion by 2030, and will, unless we take radical action. Slums are growing faster than planned land and housing developments. Um, and uh, an 800 million estimated additional urban residents are going to be living in sub-Saharan Africa by 2050. So if you think that 80% of the urban population in some cities are living outside the formal land market, housing market, just think what the pressure is going to be on land, housing, services and jobs over the next 30 years. This is historically unprecedented. 800 million is more than the combined urban population of Europe, North America, and Mexico combined. And that's over 30 years. This is a phenomenal challenge facing governments, the international community, uh, civil society, and uh, pro professional institutes. So I think we have to acknowledge that economic growth has lifted many millions, tens, hundreds of millions out of poverty. But unfortunately, the form of neoliberal economics and market-based development has also posed an incredibly heavy burden on the planet. And even more millions of people uh, are, are being denied access to decent housing. Um, and, and as we know, of course, the subprime crisis of 2008 was triggered by I would say the mismanagement of the housing sector in just one country. And I'm sure you know which country I'm referring to. So land and housing are still seen despite the subprime crisis. Uh, land and housing are still seen almost exclusively as financial assets, not a place in which to live and raise a family as part of a community. And this distortion of what land and housing means is part of what I'm writing about at the moment. So, uh, as I say, despite this crisis, land remains an asset class for investment by the landed classes uh, and the global elite, making it unaffordable, not just to the poor and not even just to middle income groups. So now it's a problem which is also affecting the global north. Uh, at a personal level, the consolation for me is, and I suddenly realized when I was in uh, Quito for the, global, uh, for the World Urban Forum 2016, uh, that it's a global problem. So I no longer personally have to feel guilty being a white British male uh, going around the world talking about these issues uh, because it's affecting my country uh, and the USA just as much as it is other countries. So this is now affecting the options and roles of professionals, governments, donors, NGOs in managing urban land and housing markets. And these options have changed dramatically. The good sign of that, I think, is that if land and housing are a physical expression of a social, economic and environmental crisis, they can therefore be part of the solution. And that's what I think is, is absolutely exciting. We need to use this uh, chance to stand back uh, to reflect on the uh, challenge and how we can solve it. So I think that uh, there are two major challenges we face. One is climate change. Uh, this image shows the trajectory of the trade winds and the cyclones that drift across from the Sahara. Maybe not everybody knows that the cyclones that hit the uh, um, Caribbean and uh, southern part of the USA um, are in fact originating in the Sahara. Um, and the, the Sahara itself is actually expanding uh, because of the of global warming, the global crisis, and it's actually expanding southwards about 30 miles a year in some places. So it's becoming bigger, it's generating more heat, and that dry heat is drifting with the trade winds westerly across the Atlantic, which is also getting warmer. So what's happening is that we're generating more frequent, more intense storms, which hit, of course, uh, the Caribbean. Uh, and I've just been working in Vanuatu, where Cyclone Pam destroyed a large part of the country in 2015. 
just three weeks ago, they were hit by Cyclone Harry, which uh, has devastated the country uh, just after they'd recovered from Cyclone Pam. So we're looking at a world where storms and the climate crisis is becoming more and more intense. Um, the other crisis which I think we need to address is global inequality. In the US, the bottom 99.9% pay 28 times more tax than the top 0.1%. Uh, market capitalism, as defined by Adam Smith, didn't just promote the private sector and self-interest. What he promoted, which people don't talk about enough, is promoting enlightened self-interest. In other words, a, a, a market in which sellers had an interest in meeting not the, just the short-term, but the long-term interests of their clients and customers. Um, so I think that's something which has been ignored by the current uh, advocates of market capitalism. Of course, neo neoliberalism goes back to the 1940s, 1950s, von Mises, uh, von Hayek, and uh, Milton Friedman, and so on. Uh, and that's led to, I think, everything now being considered as value for money. But that is concentrated benefits at the top. If you look at the Oxfam reports to Davos, the Global Economic Summit, in recent years, they were saying in 2014 the top 1% Com uh, controlled as much wealth as the lowest 50% of the population. In 2015, that was down to 85 individuals. In 2016, 62 individuals. In 27, eight individuals. In 2018, 1% of the uh, population bagged 82% of global wealth. And in 2019, billionaire income increased by 2.5 billion a day. Now, this is totally unsustainable, totally unjustifiable by any decent standards of economic development. Uh, if you look at Gini coefficients, which are measures of inequality, the higher the number, the, the higher the uh, level of inequality. There's a few examples from the Western uh, Hemisphere. Um, and as you can see, the uh, numbers are getting higher. And if we go to look at uh, um, the situation in terms of how that's happening, tax evasion and avoidance with multinational corporations is condoned by the UK with its tax havens, though the EU is doing more to fight back. And if you look at inequality, where are the most unequal countries? We can see that uh, uh, this is uh, a record of uh, some of the uh, countries. If you look at uh, the World Happiness, Happiness Report, it's interesting that Vanuatu is the most vulnerable country in the world and yet scores regularly as among the happiest, partly because their expectations are low and because they've got a low ecological footprint and live within their means. If you look at the uh, inequality index by country, you can see here on the right the USA and the UK uh, score very badly in terms of the levels of inequality. So there's a lot we need to do to explain how these issues affect land and housing. In the UK, for example, you're looking here at an estate owner um, who's got a vast estate. I took this photograph flying over his uh, estate on a glider. Um, uh, and uh, 1% of the population in the UK owns 70% of all land. A third of that is held by the aristocracy. And the guy who owns this particular estate was critical in making decisions about people who lived in a tower block, social housing, which caught fire uh, uh, recently with the deaths of 72 people. So the gulf between the rich and the poor is now so great that people in power, people in positions of privilege are making decisions on behalf of people about they know, whom they know nothing and care even less. And this is what makes me angry. And this is what's got to change. In the UK, Margaret Thatcher, at the same time as Ronald Reagan in the US, began the privatization of social housing. Um, and uh, you can see that social housing became derelict. Uh, people lived there who do, couldn't afford to buy their housing. Uh, were, uh, ended up living in what were called single states. Um, and they had no sympathy. In, the, uh, in Cambodia, in, in the global south, people were uh, 
uh, forced to live on bits of land that nobody else, want, else wanted, alongside roads, alongside canals and uh, railway lines. Um, and yet we see the professional government response often completely unrelated to these realities. This is an urban development plan for Dar es Salaam, where 80% of the people live in informal settlements. And yet the government commissioned Korean planners to prepare a master plan for extending the city. This reminds me of Corbusier's uh, image for the city. Uh, and in, uh, in Rwanda, uh, Vanessa Watson has published this uh, uh, study showing how uh, the government there plans a massive redevelopment of the city. I don't imagine this was designed very much for the 70% or whatever on middle and low income um, uh, household uh, levels. So images of what the professions, what governments like, need to be much more closely related to what the needs of the population are. As if you look at the UN indicator for uh, house price uh, ratios, uh, the cost of buying properties is now completely unrelated to incomes around the world. Uh, UN Habitat says four to one ratio of, of annual household income uh, to house prices is anything over four to one is unaffordable. Five to one is seriously unaffordable. If you look at some of these, you can see it goes up to 14 to one in Jakarta, uh, 19 points, 96 to one in uh, Bogota. So totally unaffordable, totally unrealistic uh, cost of entry to the formal housing market. So we live in conceptually un exciting times. Question is, what can we do about it? Now, I would say that if you, and this goes back to John Turner's image, if you look at an ordinary household wanting to get uh, a, a basic house, they've got to put together land, finance, services and materials. If the options for these are very, very limited, if the only way of getting land is on the market or through the government, the only way of getting finances from a bank, the getting services is from the local authority, it's not much help that there may be lots of options for getting materials. You can buy them, make them, recycle them. That's not much help if you can't get the through the first three barriers. So I would say that the main role of government needs to be to open the supply system and be the regulator of that supply system. Because if there's a very limited range of options, going back to the original one, there is no, no pressure at all on whoever supplies those systems to respond to the variety and diversity of demand. There's no incentive to be efficient. There's no, there's no incentive to respond to change. But if you have a diverse system in which the, reg the government regulates the supply and stimulates the supply, social housing, co-housing, civil society, participatory housing, um, as well as government uh, and, uh, and market uh, housing, then you've got a much more open range of options and which enables it to be demand sensitive. And that, to me, seems to be the principle on which government action should be based. So if we move forward, you could say, well, is ownership the answer? And anyone who's read Hernando de Soto's book will be under the impression that ownership of property is the answer to all this. He even calls his book, The Mystery of Capital, why capitalism triumphs in the West and fails everywhere else, is because people lacking ownership are unable to use their assets of land or property uh, as collateral. And we all know that pushing that too far led to the subprime crisis. So I would say that in the UK, we talk about a property owning democracy, but we've only been a property owning democracy basically since 1928 after the Second World War. Um, and uh, Thatcher, as I say, sold uh, over a million public housing assets for a tenth of their value encouraging the use of housing as a, as a commodity. Getting on the property ladder was promoted by De Soto and the World Bank in the early days. Uh, UK house prices shot up 47 times between 1970 and 20, 2007 until the bubble burst. 
so looking at housing as an asset, I think, has been part of the problem um, and has led to high levels of home ownership um, uh, not needed, uh, I would say, by the young, the poor or the old. Um, so I would say that if any country has more than two thirds of, the, of its housing stock in ownership, they're probably using ownership for the wrong reason, as a speculative asset rather than uh, as, a, as meeting housing needs. Um, so you've got uh, high levels of, of, of home, uh, home ownership are often associated with economic vulnerability. Um, China and Cuba, 90%. Greece 75% and so on. And yet you look at Germany and Switzerland with very low levels of home ownership. No one has accused me or told me that they're suffering from uh, economic crises. So home ownership, I think, is not the answer uh, to uh, economic well-being. And I would say that the 67% rule uh, suggests to me that that should be the maximum that any country should regard as reasonable and sustainable. Now, if you look at many countries around the world, in the global south for a moment, um, you would see a wide range of tenure categories. And looking at this, and uh, you, you go from living on the street to being a tenant in a squatter house, the owner of a squatter house, a regularized house, and so on. And only a small percentage of these, the top th three, eight, nine, and 10 in this list, are actually formally, legally um, occupying property. So if you're looking to intervene, I would say imposing ownership on one category is massively distorting the market and therefore the behavior of every other category in that uh, total range of, of uh, tenure categories. So what's the alternative? Well, I would say a better approach is to improve the the rights of people low down the continuum or the spectrum. If you improve the rights of people, then you're not necessarily distorting the market, but you're reducing the level of inequality and you're improving the security of people at that lower level of the spectrum. And then if you were to say that, say the, the gap between one category or subcategory and another, is making it difficult for people to move from one level to the next, then that would be a particular point where the government could intervene by introducing another category of tenure. So I think there's a whole range of options which can be introduced short term, medium term, long term, which can improve the efficiency of, a, of an existing complex land and housing market. Uh, I've represented that uh, on, a, on a single sheet of paper. I won't have time to go into that now, but there are resources on my website uh, which can enable people to see how you can actually um, provide a, a, a showing the tenure categories in your city. Now, I need to move on quick, quickly. What to do about informal settlements? Uh, I think I've demonstrated that tenure systems are complicated, that to achieve uh, success, you need to have social legitimacy as much as legality. The ownership is not appropriate for everybody. Uh, and that titles and ownership may be useful, but will not increase access to credit if incomes are low. And we've seen the uh, Asia 1998 crisis, the USA UK crisis 2008. Um, and uh, I think these are lessons we need to learn from. A pluralistic approach is better. And to accept that change on these things takes time. There's no simple solution. There's a range, as I say, of short-term, medium-term, long-term options around the world, uh, which we can build on and have relevance, I think, in a wide range of contexts. So options for, two, uh, op options for progress number two, I would say, is land management and planning. We need to promote inward investment in ways which promote economic development, but which also enable to the state to capture a reasonable proportion of the surplus generated through the provision of planning permission and increased land values. And that can be redistributed to those in greatest need. In other words, the government should move from being a controller to being a regulator of the market. 
and in making sure that the, the actions of the state, which actually massively impact land values, can be captured to a reasonable extent by the state for redistribution to meet social policy objectives. So I would say that a simple lesson for planning and uh, architecture and surveyors and engineers, find out what works in a given context and find ways of building on it. It's not a very complex situation, but I'm amazed at how for infrequently this approach is applied. I think we professionals need to understand how to manage land markets in the public interest and create a robust, transparent means of maximizing public benefit. I'm not against profit, but I do think that the benefits and the costs need to be more equitably distributed. And there's a whole range of ways in which we can uh, do that through. Um, so I think uh, regulatory frameworks, this is something I did with uh, the urban housing manual, regulatory frameworks need to permit appropriate standards. Um, standards uh, in Uganda were totally unaffordable, in fact made it impossible for the majority of the population to be legal. In Mongolia, every individual citizen is entitled to up to 700 square meters free, but that makes the cost of infrastructure provision impossible. Although India permits plot sizes of 25 square meters. So I think we need to tax land according to its approved value uh, and, make, and reclaim land not developed in time, encourage public-private partnerships, and make sure that smart cities are well regulated, not just high tech. For example, if you look at Chennai in India, that was designated as one of 100 smart cities. Six weeks later, people were walking around in, in sewage water because they hadn't upgraded the 19th century uh, infrastructure. So start with the basics, get those sorted, and then start talking about smart technology. Options for progress number three, I'm coming to the end, uh, but uh, I, I, there's a few more points I want to make. I think we need to increase the scale and diversity of, of housing supply. Identify constraints to the existing system, as I've mentioned. Make sure that design standards reflect realities, not just aspirations, as they were doing in Rwanda and, and uh, Tanzania. We need to enable land and buildings to be financed separately. So you can buy the land and then build on it as you can afford, not just uh, have the two built together. Uh, we need to promote a mixture of land uses and tenure options to promote social integration and diversity. Uh, permit basic, really basic starter homes uh, to reduce entry costs, sites and services, energy walls where you provide the wall with the services and let people do the rest for themselves. Apparently, I'm credited on Wikipedia for coining the term first world problems because I published something in 1979 saying third world solutions from, to first world problems, meaning we can learn from urbanizing countries uh, that are forced to innovate. Uh, we need to upgrade existing substandard housing where possible and obviously promote co-housing, which enables people to share uh, domestic facilities. Care homes, housing for the elderly, there's some very interesting innovations there, which some of which provide accommodation for students to live free, providing they provide a certain number of hours of care a month to the elderly residents. All sorts of interesting and exciting innovations are being pioneered. Here's a guy in the UK. When the, uh, I was in Uganda and they wanted standards of housing appropriate for a middle income country. I showed them this and said, look, this is a high income country. This house is less than 1.5 meters wide. And the guy is boasting about it because it was what he could afford. And he was on the market boasting about this house. The Ugandans simply couldn't believe that this was possible. They wanted high standards for a middle income country. But we, I'm not advocating this. I'm not promote, promoting it. Uh, all I'm saying is that we need to be more realistic when we talk about what people can afford. Um, UK is a very proud record in the past of social housing that uh, was a world leader at the time. We need to get back to recognizing that the, the social housing does also have a role. 
mixed land use in Cambodia. Very flexible, very cost effective, very reasonable standards uh, and very affordable. Uh, Self-sufficiency taken to the extreme. This was a woman I met in Mongolia living in the middle of nowhere with a satellite dish. Uh, her, her battery was powered by solar panel and uh, the satellite dish to watch soap operas in Korea in the, being in the middle of nowhere in Mongolia. Um, improving connectivity physically, the infrastructure in Medellin uh, helped to transform one of the most dangerous parts of one of the most dangerous cities into a tourist attraction. Improving connectivity um, and uh, also um, improving access. Uh, you've even got fun in the sense that children can now go down the slide. It doesn't take much space. Murals on the walls, they all make a place much more habitable. In Indonesia, they improve the infrastructure. They don't change anything else, but as you can see, another example of a street being used as a living space with people having their chairs on, on the thing and the drainage going down each side with people putting pot plants on each side above the drain and keeping it clear as it goes past their house. Similarly, another scheme in Indonesia. Another scheme, they have competitions to make the entrances exciting and fun, to make you feel better as you go home or go out to work. In Albania, the mayor was an artist and he had no money to improve the communist housing, so he painted everything, different colours. If you Google Tirana colours, these are examples of what you see. He's now not just the mayor, but he's the prime minister of the country. Uh, we were doing proposals to see how you could uh, redevelop uh, areas with community participation to make the land under a land readjustment scheme more efficient and provide community facilities, uh, give everybody security and sell some of the additional plots on a more efficient basis than being done now in order for everybody to be economically better off and uh, living in a better environment. It can be win-win if you do it right. In India, very modest standards, 25 square meter plots, but surrounding little small courtyards so that everybody had a, a access to an open space. And I've seen two or three story buildings on, on developments like that. They even built a show house and you can see the courtyard where everyone would then be given the plot and allowed to get on with it, do whatever they could. Uh, and when we were in, working in Egypt, we did a whole series of examples. So you have the higher income, uh, developments on the main road with courtyards linking other roads uh, on the assumption that they would get their services later but they wouldn't have to pay the full cost. So incremental development, um, allowing things to take place over time, don't expect everything to happen just at, at once. So putting it all together, just uh, bringing things to an end, I would say that the big political challenge is, is if the elites in power, the economic and political elites, given all the examples I've told you about, all of which are in the public domain, all of which we know about as professionals, why aren't they being implemented more quickly, more widely? And I would say that the big concern I have, the big question we need to address is that if the elites are happy with the status quo, why should they change? We as professionals need to, and academics need to be much more persuasive in addressing those in power or promoting alternative champions. We cannot stand on the fence because everything we do is ultimately political. The Paris Accord, the SDGs, uh, the COP uh, climate crisis things are now giving us opportunities to be much stronger regulators in putting multinational corporations on notice. We need similar approaches to land management and planning. The relationship between the state and market is key. Many governments promote innovation. The entrepreneurial state by uh, Mariana Matsukato is a good example. How can we combine the best of capitalism and socialism to create more socially and environmentally sustainable markets? I would call it social capitalism. When I asked a friend in Cuba, who I was going to give a, a, a conference presentation to, if she thought social capitalism was a good title. She said, no, 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 don't mention the word capitalism. So I said, how about regulated markets? Oh, that's very good. 
So in other words, the terms we use for these ideas are critical. We need to say how we can make become more persuasive in promoting these principles and giving the examples that work. I think we also have to accept we cannot keep consuming indefinitely. We need to ask what we mean by a good quality of life. A very good book I like is Skidelsky, How Much Is Enough? Another book, The Spirit Level by uh, uh, Wilkinson and Pickett, uh, talking about why equality is good for us. I think what we need to do now is to define what we mean by a good quality of life and how land and housing can be a means of achieving this. And of course, housing is central to all of this. Smart cities require smart regulation, as I say. Policies and plans must be based, based on what people need and can afford. Um, and planning standards, regulations and procedures need to be appropriate. So I would say that this is the most exciting time. The sustained public professional pressure will be needed to put this theory into practice. Thank you very much. Um, okay, thank you so much, Jeff. I think we can uh, perhaps- uh, That's about the... 45 minutes, I think. Yeah, 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 that was great, great timing. Very, very British. Uh, I would say very Swiss. Um, I think that we can open the, uh, open the stage, as, as, as to speak, for questions. Um, just open your mics and ask questions because uh, it's faster than trying to find out who is holding their hand. Uh, let's try the, the uh, chaotic approach to Zoom and see how it goes. But thanks for your enlightening presentation. That's uh, you touching so many important issues for planners that uh, it was difficult to follow because it was so complex and dense, touching so many complicated uh, problems we're facing. Um, so um, we got 36 participants. Um, so uh, who uh, is going to ask the first question? Don't be okay. shy. I, I, I'll ask the first question. Be okay um, to turn, I would ask people to turn their cameras on. It's much nicer for the speaker to see mm. you face okay. to face. Okay, I'll ask the first question. The, um, in, a, in the United States, we're in a, in a place where overconsumption <laughs> is, is supported. I mean, make it uh, mm -hmm. more expensive, uh, um, larger larger lots and um in the developing world or some of the examples you said you basically said the consumption is related to need and not aspiration so um how do you balance this need versus aspiration because in the west everyone is you know we're pushing uh to aspire for more and uh better standards and um, and I don't know how you approach this, you know, how do you get this balance? Yeah. It's a good question. And uh, in a way, it uh, was one of the, the key questions that the book I mentioned, uh, How Much Is Enough, was addressing. Because mm. in 1930, John Maynard Keynes published uh, a piece for his grandchildren, for when they would be uh, adults around the year 2000, he assumed. And his argument was that technological innovation would enable everybody to meet their needs after only working 15 hours a week. So no one would need to work more than 15 hours a week because technology would meet their needs. And so the book was saying, well, obviously that hasn't happened. People are working nonstop, day and night, eight days a week. Uh, so what went wrong? And they realized that what he was talking about was the difference between needs, which are finite, and wants, which are infinite. And of course, if you haven't got the latest phone, if you haven't got the latest car, the latest fashion of clothes, there's something rather sad about you. And the whole thing of advertising is to make you want more and more and more. Um, and I was just watching The Simpsons last night, and oddly enough, they were talking about advertising being you know, something that should be taxed more heavily. Um, 
And so when the Simpsons are making a, a political point like that, you know, it's gone mainstream. And I think that for me, the question is, how much do we need? How many new things do we need to have a good quality of life? Do we need more and more on the basis that we can't continue growing and consuming? The people in Vanuatu live in a very, very modest environment, well, a very, very vulnerable environment, very threatening environment, but with very modest expectations, and they are happier. Now, I'm not suggesting that we should go back to living in uh, extremely basic houses, but I do think this is a chance for us to say what we regard as important. And this pandemic has given us all the chance to breathe fresher air, to realize who the important contributors to society are, and they're the key workers more than the wealth creators. So I think, you know, there's enough wealth going around for us to ask how it should be better distributed. And I don't think there's been enough of the, that discussion, which of course inevitably becomes highly political. But I think this is a time when we need to think big and act big. I don't know if that answers your question, Bill. Well, um, I, I think I think thinking big is what what we need, um, and um, the um, and pushing through the conflicts of um, you know the the property titles. And you said you had a part on land tenure, uh, a whole discussion on land tenure, which I think. It's good that you brought that up and people could discuss it. And the question is, what is the, what is the value of land tenure? Uh, is it to provide the uh, access to homes or is it to accumulate wealth? I mean, it, once, once it becomes an asset, the system distorts because yeah. as, a, as an asset, um, the, it's, it looks like any other sort of asset class and it's treated that way by the mechanisms of the legal system in the society and, and, and laws and institutions. So um, rather than going from needs to assets, I, I think that we have a, a, a where I agree with you. I mean, we're totally, you know, over a home ownership, but we have at least in the United States now um, almost giving, giving away the, the cost of the asset by lowering the interest rate, but by raising the, the sales price, which makes a burden on the consumer or the owner. So I, I, don't, I, I think we have to be much more flexible on the asset side, but I think we should push against anything that, that supports you know, the housing as assets uh, rather than housing as shelter. I agree. That, that's that's central to what I, I, I I'm doing, and uh, I totally agree with you. Uh, any any more questions? As you, you can see, I changed my background. Yes, uh, it's more appropriate. That's, <laughs> that's Caracas, I think. No, that's no, Bill. Yeah. That's Santa Marta. Actually, Bill. Oh, really? Santa Marta. No, yeah. that's no, yeah. that's that's. that's he wants to make his his part. Of, <laughs> he, he, he wants to make his. He wants to make his his neighborhood in in Lisbon look like that. <laughs> so, um, any questions, guys? Please okay. come okay. forward. So I'm going next. Hey. Ah. Cornelius. Uh, there, there, there's, this is the Cornelius's yeah. project. In. Do you uh, would you happen to have heard of anybody called? Uh, Professor Trevalion, maybe not. No. Okay, that's all right. Um, so the the introductory part of your presentation made a very good case for the need for quality, uh, for quantity, and for affordability of housing. Right. You made that case very clear. I mean, there is no. We are, you know, we are, the situation is just getting worse and worse. And we need to strike a balance between quantity and affordability. So that would suggest to us that high density development will be the way to go to get as many units as possible 
you know, of course, depending on the construction and how fancy it is at affordable price. But it looks like you reach a point in the high density development, some of the examples you show about Kigali and the rest, that then the units are no longer affordable to most people. And then you also showed the picture of, you know, that fire, you know, I believe, you know, London. So you have a situation where emergency, you know, can be quite deadly. And, but then towards the end, you showed an example of one, some of the newer developments happening in India, supposed to be a modern, affordable, go two to three levels, you know, that's just about it. So my question to you is, what are your thoughts on how dense, where should we strike that balance in building density, housing density, where we can get the, quant the quality and the affordability that we need for most of the people in the world. I'm thinking more developing countries. <clears throat> That's a very good question um, and a very important point. Um, I think that I was struck by uh, the observation that Abbas Jha from the World Bank made the other day on, on LinkedIn when he was saying, we need to make a slight distinction between density on land and uh, space per person. Now, if you take uh, Manhattan, for example, that's obviously high density, but everybody has a reasonable amount of space per person. You might get the same density in, uh, in uh, Lagos or Mumbai, where people are crammed together on the ground floor, um, which is obviously a very different outcome, but the same density. Um, in my experience, it's quite possible to get reasonably high density with medium rise development. It doesn't have to be a tower block. Um, if you look at many, many countries around the world, I've seen uh, four story, sometimes five with a semi basement, uh, can produce very acceptable, decent housing at quite high density with a reasonable space per person um, and at an affordable level. Uh, especially if you have a mixture of uses, if say the ground floor is commercial, uh, if it's an inner city area, um, and then that defrays the cost so that you can achieve more affordability. Uh, but uh, the land cost, of course, is a major element of building cost in any urban area. I would say, certainly in London, the land cost is 75% at least of the, build, of the total cost. So land use planning uh, and city planning at the, uh, at the uh, larger scale, I think is critical, sorry, critical, my throat's getting a bit dry, um, is critical to keeping the total costs within reason. And that suggests multi-nuclear spatial planning uh, so that the uh, costs of land are not concentrated in the central business district and then going out towards the suburbs. I think spatial planning can be a, a very important means of keeping total costs down and enabling medium rise density, uh, and a medium high density to be affordable and give decent outcomes. Does that answer your question? Yes, very much, thank you. Um, I, I think that when Jeff showed that slide with the uh, uh, multiple um, sources and how we can, multiply the, the entries towards the housing, I, I, it came to my mind how expensive it is to uh, build here in San Luis Obispo. Uh, Beate, I think it's right here. She just, she's trying to finalize her own house and the cost of taxes and uh, local taxes and all the fees that she has to pay to get one residence approved, it's around 80,000 bucks. So 80,000 bucks is, I mean, if you add that on top of cost of land, cost of construction, uh, labor here is very expensive. I mean, with 80,000 bucks of fees, you can buy a mansion in any developing country. 
So and of I course, that's, uh, yeah, that's absolutely right. And of course, many developers actually constrain the supply because that is their profit margin. Uh, so I think uh, there's a, a very big uh, requirement for government. If you give planning permission, if you don't develop it within five years or whatever, you sacrifice the land, you know, and it reverts to the state. So governments need to use the powers that they've got to actually make sure that uh, planning permission once granted is actually turned into developments on the ground. So um, can you all hear me? Um, my name is Alex Hines. <laughs> Years ago, I was the planning and building director in San Luis Obispo, where is how I met most of these great folks. Uh, excellent lecture. Uh, I agree with 99.9% .9 of everything that was has been brought up by you and the others. Uh, of course, it reminds me of a theme that you mentioned a little earlier, which pretty much is never waste a good crisis to, to um, create change. And um, I'm pretty familiar with how you make things actionable in our country or our context. But in light of the COVID-19 and the sort of oversimplification that, uh, that density is the cause of the spread, of the community spread, and uh, some of the other changes which are not necessarily going to be helpful, some will be very helpful, do you have ideas on how to take these good principles and examples and actually get them implemented? I think there's two parts to that, um, in the sense that so one is the argument for improving change. And I think we need to be, as I said, much more um, skillful in identifying the arguments that are likely to be successful. Uh, when I was in teaching, I, I, I used to set my students a particular exercise. I'd ask them to design a project, and they'd design the project, and then in groups. And then I'd say, okay, uh, on Friday, you're all going to make presentations. Group A will present to another uh, group of professionals. Group B to the World Bank. Group B to uh, a local government. And the third group to a community. The same proposal. Now, they hadn't really thought that the same thing needs to be presented differently to different audiences. And I do think that as professionals, to develop the skills in identifying what arguments are likely to carry weight. I was working in Cuba on a project years ago and I had some very good advice given to me when the person said before you meet the governor ask him what his problems are and then present your proposal. Think quickly and think how your proposal can be the solution to his understanding of the problem not your own. And I think that, that, that is part of the, the answer I would give to you on, in terms of the arguments to use. In terms of the space, in terms of the density, I do think public open space and the way we distribute it and design it can have a very important role in, uh, in mediating interactions and uh, giving space not only in the event of an earthquake or fire alarm, but also in terms of social interaction. Uh, I was amused by the, the, the retired planner in Navi, Mumbai, who used, after he retired, could sit in the local public space. And in the morning, all the maids would come and meet and discuss, complain about the madams they worked for. Mid-morning, the madams would come and complain about their maids. Lunchtime, all the office workers complained about their bosses. Afternoon, the men, women complained about their teenagers. In the evening, the teenagers came to complain about their parents. So he realized that that space was like a safety valve for the whole community. So I think public space can be a very important factor in how we mediate these elements. I don't know if that answers your question. No, oh, that was great. I think. Um credibility and customizing the, the message and uh, active listening are, uh, are incredibly important as well. So thanks again for doing this. So Jeff, this is Hema. Hi, good to see you after Hi. so long. Hi, good to see you. 
Thank you so much. That was a great overview of the um, housing context and the ways we might think of approaching it. So I really appreciated uh, that perspective, uh, which is a broad perspective. Uh, it's such a vast topic that, uh, you know, you have to think of income, you have to think of context, you have to think of culture, gender relationships. I mean, it's impossible to deal with the spectrum of things. Um, I, th I think you touched on a couple of very key issues uh, that I found useful when talking to the students. And, you know, you think of housing as the regulatory side, the design side, and then the financing side, uh, the developer side of things. And, um, you know, the, the resident does have control over how much space they demand. And as you know, in India, with your work in Delhi, your mine in Bombay and Pune, uh, the space wants and needs of most of the population is uh, so constrained. I mean, they are, a, they think more modestly about the size of uh, housing that they would like. Um, in this country, having lived in Arizona and now in San Luis Obispo, um, the culture is very different and we've been very much encouraged to think bigger, to think more monumentally, uh, the sort of uh, uh, the sort of housing we've been encouraged to want. So I, and, and I think in India I'm finding over 30 years of going back to one locale in Pune because I built a small house for my mother there and so I keep going mm -hmm. back and seeing how the squatter settlements have transformed, partly with provision of services by the city and a lot of self-help on the part of the squatter settlement owners. And they're gradually uh, very acceptable domiciles that fit the space needs of that particular sector of the economy. And similarly, so th I think there's a lot to be said for allowing uh, consumers to make the choice uh, for their part, but, but the city's role in giving them land tenure, giving them security, giving them services. In a, in a de developing country, that seems over time to actually be yielding perfect, reasonably habitable domiciles for people. Mm. But I want to share, ask you, uh, because I've been on the planning commission in San Luis Obispo for seven, eight years now. <laughs> it takes a lot of time and energy, but one of my roles, the reasons for staying on, is to try and affect the kind of housing that we build in the city. And it is exactly that sort of, it, it is um, exchange value as much as use value that dominates in San Luis Obispo. Um, and the exchange value determines what the developers will go after. Now, recently with the housing crisis in California, we've been privileging smaller by design, uh, densification, 80% of land use is R1, residential, various kinds of residential, largely R1. But we've been privileging densification by accessory dwelling units, by tiny homes and things like that, but also uh, by approving smaller units downtown. The thing we don't do though, and we would be, we are very reluctant to do, is to get a quid pro quo from the developer on either rent or price. And um, I, I'd love to have your opinion on that and other people with a lot of experience who are in this group, uh, because I've always been struck by how shy and diffident cities are in this country to get a quid pro quo on price or rent from the developer community. So over the seven years, I've seen projects that we thought would come in and be more accessible to the young people who want to live in the city. And the prices are runaway prices. There's not a hope that they can get into them. It's a conundrum. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a, it's a key issue, I agree. Um, I, I've just finished a report for UN, uh, which is being peer reviewed at the moment, so I can't release it just yet. Um, but that's looking at land based finance for affordable housing. 
um, and looking at a range of instruments, uh, development uh, charges, uh, tax uh, incentives, uh, various other options that are applied in different countries at different times and different ways um, to see how that can improve access to affordable housing. Um, but there is a document that has been recently published, I'm talking about two or three weeks ago, uh, by Jean Duplessis, uh, if you, Jean, J-E-A-N, D-U, Plessis, P-L-E-W-S, he's with UN Habitat. So, uh, and he's pu published a very good report, Land-Based Finance for Improved Governance. You might well find that of interest. It's very comprehensive and uh, his focus, mine will focus on housing. But I, I think that governments are very slow at identifying and even slower in applying the powers that they have potentially to generate a social benefit from, from private uh, sector development. Um, as I mentioned, the work by Mariano Mazzucato, uh, the entrepreneurial state, she shows many examples, many of them in the US, of where the state has been funding uh, developments which the, the private sector often claims as its own. I mean, technology in the iPhone, for example, was a result of public investment. Uh, and therefore, she builds the argument that the public sector has a moral right, as well as a political justification, in extracting a benefit from the investment that it has made. And it's very slow at doing it. Very slow. And this is not arguing for socialism or communism or anything extreme. This is trying to make capitalism work in a more socially responsible and environmentally sustainable manner. How can we get the same amount of good housing using less land? How can we make that housing affordable? Uh, these are very simple questions and the powers do exist. I'll give you one example in London. Many years ago, I went to see the opening of a scheme, a, a, a public, uh, sorry, a private investment scheme right on the River Thames. And even the trees looked as though they'd been designed by the architects. I mean, everything was architecturally immaculate. And this was probably 15 years ago, 12 years ago. And even then, the standard private houses on the riverfront were five and a half million pounds five bedroom, five bathrooms, luxury housing, small plots, but nice houses. But what was interesting was that of the 1800 units, 50%, not facing the river, but on the same land, were for key workers and socially affordable. And the reason that happened was because the mayor of the city, Ken Livingston said, if you want planning permission for this site, and you're getting the land cheap because it had been polluted land and the state cleared the land and so on. If you want this land, I reckon that you can afford to provide 50% of the units at cost. No profit at all. And you will make your profit on the other 50%. The developer agreed. Since then, he set up the standard that if any developer objected to a high social benefit, he would send a consultant to inspect their, their financial evidence. And if he thought that they could provide a higher percentage of social benefit, either in the form of housing, primary schools, open space, whatever it was, they would be required to do that or not get planning permission. And I see no reason at all why that couldn't be applied universally as a condition of planning permission. You, you inspect the books, you ask them what they think is a reasonable profit margin, and you say to them, look, if you want, to, obviously the profit margin depends on risk. If a, if a development authority can say to a developer, we will make it easy for you to make a modest percentage, we'll make it bloody difficult for you to make an outrageous profit. 
which game would you like to play? Would you like to negotiate? And given that every piece of land has a different land value, you have to make that negotiation on a site by site basis. But if you have the principle of extracting a maximum public benefit and then you negotiate skillfully and toughly with the private sector, if they want to do business, you welcome them. If they're not willing to negotiate, good luck, goodbye, would be my attitude. Now, I don't know if you think, because you're in a position of actually having to do it. I'm a, I'm a mere consultant academic. Do you think that that approach would carry weight? Well, I, I, I use the publications of London uh, under Ken as, as exemplars. They, uh, from the rough, rough sleepers. I mean, there were very enlightened policies, so absolutely right on that. Um, the local government that I have seen uh, here and in Arizona um, is very timid about their relationship with development. Uh, they, they are very concerned and the, I think the community too is concerned about regulatory overreach. So we stay with technical stuff. We stay with, and now um, I, I think Alex, you might have something to say about this because you were planning committee, you were head of planning here. But I think there's a reluctance to push developers too far. Uh, and the private initiative and private ownership sentiment here is so strong that uh, things that you know need to happen, the appetite for pushing is not there and the lawyers yeah. are always lurking in the wings to sue the city. Yeah, it's the same in London now, sadly. Is it? Yeah. You know, when I started out, uh, I noticed very quickly that the best planners were the new ones that didn't have a mortgage and were still idealistic and the old ones, <laughs> third time now or never, we're going for it. Uh, kids are out of college, um, yeah. and wow. uh, this is our time. Um, I, I found that if you start with um, broad, general guiding principles that are common sense, like we should help, you know, people in need, and that we should be, you know, we shouldn't be wasteful and inefficient in our dealings uh, with land development and preservation. Uh, that that's, uh, whoops, I'm getting a call. Um, that helps when it isn't tied to a specific project and it's put in a, in a way that isn't threatening. And then uh, later on, um, and by saying, starting with those, they should get in the general plan because in California, the general plan is legally supposed to rule. Um, and then as you build up credibility um, and kind of common sense of approach, um, you just have to stick your neck out and you do that by being respectful and uh, listening to people and uh, providing them with alternatives. And, they, and uh, they don't always work, but I'm gonna give one example that I, I did here in uh, Marin. Uh, and I don't know how well it worked. I, it was sort of a, on my way out, we took, um, we had a, a housing study done. It was basically like a performa in some ways. Um, but basically we looked at the economics of, of housing and it looked at the big homes and it, uh, it found out, as we hoped, that um, in a sense we were, that those, those extra large homes were preventing by taking up land uh, what, um, they were basically making smaller uh, homes less, less affordable because they're taking up lands in a, in a limited supply when you have a, a plan that only designates certain areas. And so we basically exempted from, from a, an affordable housing fee the small homes, um, but after a certain size, we said, well, you got to chip in, you know, whatever it was, I don't remember now, $5 a square foot or $2 a square foot, $10. Um, for any, any home over say, you know, 1800 square feet, something reasonable. And it was adopted and we got some of the other cities to adopt it at the same time. So you couldn't play one off against the other. And um, I've lost track of it, but 
But that's the kind of thing is through collaboration mm. with the other jurisdictions come up with common sense approaches. Um, and uh, when you talk about encouraging citizen participation, I always took that to mean especially encourage those uh, participation and representation of those that have not had uh, has been as privileged in the past. And if you get a room full of people at a planning commission meeting, or as you, as you would know, and or a city council meeting, and they're well represented and well spoken, sometimes the elected officials end up doing things they really didn't intend to do when they walked in the door. Not, no guarantees, but that's, that's sort of the formula I, I tried to use. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would like to uh, encourage the, the, the few remaining students, um, or um, if you will have a question, because we, the, the, our, our faculty tends to jump in before you guys. I'm sorry about that. Now we have, still have like five or six students. Do you have any, 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 any comments, any questions? Uh, I see Henry, Carlos, um, Christabel, Nick. Um, Kobo is not a student, although he's young enough, but <laughs> he's there. Okay, nobody has any questions. So um, I suppose that uh, if nobody has a, um, any question, I think that it's, uh, it's time for, it's time for uh, that uh, in, in, in England. And we should really let um, Jeff go. Um, Jeff, I owe you a beer. Maybe when this whole pandemic uh, is over, we can have a, a nice one together again at the of the, of the canal there. So um, that'll be fantastic. Thanks for the incredible Brilliant. presentation. It was so cool. Uh, I think that you brought up so many, uh, and I love that 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 term that you coined in uh, social uh, so, uh, social capitalism. I think that's that's really mm. something that. Um, it's been floating around and I think it's a, it's a great thing to remember us about that, that term because I think it does hit the, the, the right key there. So thank you very much. Um, You're very welcome. Yeah, well, thank you uh, so much. And uh, I hope- Baby, will we have a, a, will Jeff share his PowerPoint with us? Yes, so yes. I, ha I have the PowerPoint. Uh, we're gonna be transcribing this for Focus. And um, as soon as the recording is, is, um, is, uh, is done uh, and I get a link, we're gonna have that also available for people. Um, Jeff has been gracious enough to um, let us do all those things, so. Thank you, Jeff. Well, Thank it's you. great to see you. It's great to see everybody else. It's great to exchange ideas. I'd like to wish everybody all the very, very best uh, for the students, for the course and their careers, uh, for everybody else. Keep, keep doing great things, and I look forward to keeping in touch. If any of you come through London in due course, uh, hopefully yeah. things improve, do let me know. In the meantime, that fear is looking very, very tempting. I'm going to and grab one now. All the very best to all of you. Do keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you, hey, thank you very care. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kobus. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank, you. you. thank you, everybody. Uh, <laughs> okay, Jeff. So uh, let's uh, have, let's have a beer together. Maybe we can let's do that. Do that. So I'm going to go get one now, and I'll drink to your health and to everybody else's. Thank you. Thank and you. Family. Yeah. No, I think that would be great. And, uh, uh, it was good to have the discussion afterwards. Yes, that, that was a good one. So, Beat and Hema, do you still here? Do you have to? Ex I mean, I don't know if Jeff wants to stay longer, but um, do you I don't mind staying longer if they want to. I just wanted to say that I'm really sorry that I didn't study or, you know, at that time when you took all those students to Turkey, that looked amazing. <laughs> so I actually wish I would have been part of that. So. Yeah, we, we, we never told you that we were putting, we were arrested, like, so to speak, right? Remember, Jeff, that yeah. everybody was scared shitless uh, about that. But that was a, I, that's uh, one of my good memories about that trip. <laughs> Uh, a little yeah. bit of drama spices things up. Right, yeah. I'm, I'm really looking forward to reading your report for you and Habitat. I, I think it, this might be a moment where people begin to reconsider a little bit about what kind of housing they're choosing and the costs and so on. 
um, we, it's been, it's really frustrating here at a city like Slow, which is very desirable place to be, where you do, you do try and push the developer to build smaller, to give concessions, but um, the, the government is very reluctant to, mm. except if there's federal money in the pool, uh, just through this negotiation process, they're very reluctant to uh, put any curbs on the profit. So in a really attractive city like this one, um, even very small, dense units start getting phenomenally mm. high prices. Uh, Henry, what would, what would you say that this is one of the key issues that needs to be addressed? I think that it, unless the government puts ceilings onto the profits that the that the because they uh, the, the profits that the developers are going to make, I mean they are getting those profits because of the quality of the city that they're investing in. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, but the city has, is very shy of capitalizing. San Francisco is one of the exceptions, I think, that they, exert, they exert a lot more from the developer. But smaller cities like Slo, uh, you know, the, they, they are much more vulnerable, I think, to the economic pressures and a little more insecure about their cachet. So the cachet is there. But the government is really reluctant to push too hard on that. Mm. Emma, well, how much? How much do you think? Uh, how much do you think Proposition Thirteen uh, is an, an impediment to that? Because um, ultimately, local governments don't have much interest in improving housing because they get very indirect benefits. Am I right? <laughs> So the red, that's why your, red, your costs are so high to get a permit. You uh -huh. have, the government has to have money from somewhere. Yeah. So your yeah. permitting fees go, go up. The, the, the revenue comes from other sources. Uh, mm. I'm not sure if Jeff knows what Proposition 13 is. Maybe you can... No. Yeah, it's, it's kept the tax increases to a regulated percentage, Jeff. And it was passed because... Um, the community was upset about homeowner uh, housing prices, uh, be, housing becoming out of reach, and was trying to cap the government's ability to tax. Uh, uh, so Proposition 13 means that people who were in housing 30, 40 years ago in a city like this pay maybe one-eighth of what a new buyer will pay because the tax is set at the market mm. Mm. at the purchase price but once you once that's set it can only go up at a certain percentage right and, right. and most most of the taxes don't stay local they go uh county and state and then they come back year ah. so you you can't profit from 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 um property tax like 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 most cities can, um, so uh, you can change the uh, value map of the city according to um, the market and tax more, uh, but you, you can't do that here. But what sort of profit margin would a developer expect? Sorry? What, what sort of profit margin or return on investment would a developer expect? They're very cagey about that. I bet they are. <laughs> uh, and so I don't have a good answer for you for that. Okay. But I think it's whatever price the market will yield. Uh, mm. And so it's going to be interesting to see. We approved a property and uh, pushed for smaller. And we pushed for three-story three, three story multifamily too, which they don't like here. They like single family. And the prices have come in very high before this epidemic. And uh, the, they haven't sold, they're, they're, they're still under construction. But I'm wondering if the epidemic is going to have a dampening influence on the market. Then we will see what prices they really ask for and get because that will give us an indication of their profits. Yeah. It's yes. very hard to get it otherwise, Jeff. Yeah, 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 yeah. I bet. Very interesting. The sad way of having to get it, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, the other thing is that that the 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 the, 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 the 
the network, the, the web of regulations and, and, uh, and uh, nimbism uh, and, uh, and lawsuits. Um, I, I think I sent you an interesting article that was published recently about this people in, uh, in a, I can't remember the name of, this, of the city in, the, in, the, in Los Angeles, San Diego area that they wanted to build this low income housing project, affordable housing project uh, that uh, they were going to sell them for like uh, 400,000, something like that, units. And then uh, it took them like eight, nine years to go through all the uh, hurdles um, of taxes and, and lawsuits uh, and everything else. And now they can't sell it for less than a million dollars. So uh, that was a yeah. very interesting. And I think that, I mean, coming from people <clears throat> not being an expert, I, I see that as one of the main problems is this whole bureaucracy that yeah. and uh, in well, you know, Jerry Brown, the previous governor, a pretty, he's a kind of lefty guy, a left, and um, he passed a slew of housing legislation to try and uh, get approval by ministerial right. Uh, and to make sort of regulation more flexible. Uh, but the fact is, uh, certainly coastal California, you really don't need that affordable uh, uh, finance from the feds in the valley because workforce housing and so on gets created by the market. It's in the coastal and scenic areas where the crisis, where the prices go up the federal money is just for low and very low. So the moderate is totally left out of the package. And it's the, it's the mm. moderate market, which is workforce, uh, it, it, where the battle is over external funds coming in, external people coming in, uh, being able to raise the price on anything that's developed because there's a shortfall. Mm. Yeah. And the cities don't want to encourage yeah. housing necessarily because the tax base, it's a loss leader in a taxation point of view, it, uh, from an income point of view, housing, incremental units of housing are loss leaders. Yeah. So, so, so I think in, in California, although we keep saying California, the housing market is really, you know, it's a big problem to economic development. The greatest problem is in, in the coastal areas, uh, in the high amenity areas, where in fact all the high end industry is going because it's all the highly educated people in the high end industries. They all want, they don't want to be in the Central yeah. Valley. You know, it's hot and polluting, <clears throat> pesticides everywhere. They don't want to live there. So the, the housing problem mm -hmm. is concentrated in the high amenity areas where mm. Prop 313 doesn't allow cities to recoup their costs. So why would they, they don't have a whole lot of initiative to push through a lot of housing production, except from a worker, worker perspective to mm. keep the industries going. You know, so, so if you look at the economics of it, uh, cities aren't highly motivated except at the margins for workforce housing. Yeah. Well, yeah. To, yeah, I'd love to exchange, keep on talking to you about this. We, um, hey, Emma, I, I just realized that's like 8.30 in London. Jeff yes, is yes. starving. Uh, I th yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Jeff. I, I, my, my throat is a little dry and I think it needs <laughs> be... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, when will your report come out? Uh, I don't know. As I say, okay. it's going through peer review. Um, UN Habitat is going through changes, so I have no idea. Okay. Pretty soon, but do contact the, uh, do, do download the one from John Duplessis. I will. Um, that's a very good one. I will. And I'm sure he'll, his covers most of the things that I'm talking about. Mine is just saying how these things are used for housing. Mm -hmm. um, they have told me it's going to be published sometime soon. Mm -hmm. so Look forward to it. Thank you. Uh, but I'm going to put the gist of it in this book I'm writing. I just need to get on with that now. <laughs>